very much. That's wonderful. Um, and this collection is called Stone Mattress, which is an exact translation of Stromatolite, uh, the <laughs> name for a 1.9 billion year old kind of fossil, which is the fossil of the plant form that made our oxygen. Um, that <laughs> long ago, before that time, we didn't have oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, after that time, we do have it, and that, in short form, is why you shouldn't kill the ocean, because those uh, marine algae are still making the oxygen by splitting H2O into H and O. So 60 to 80%, but in this story, in the title story of the book, the stromatolite happens to be the murder weapon. And uh, it takes place in the Arctic on a cruise ship, where I started writing it to amuse my fellow passengers. <laughs> and they were so amused that they wanted me to finish it. And the geologist in it was so excited by the thought that geology was getting into literature. <laughs> <laughs> he let me take the murder weapon home. <laughs> in my kitchen. <laughs> uh, that's not the story I'm going to read from today. I'm going to read from... Um, a story called Revenant, which is in the middle of, um, of three stories concerning um, two writers. Once one is a poet, and the other is now a quite famous author of a fantasy series, um, the kind of thing that if you were writing it in the 1960s, it would have been very far below the literary radar. But since that time, in our age of comic cons and, and cosplay, um, this has come to the fore, and academics are now studying it, and the authors of such are now being interviewed in a somewhat serious way. Um, so this is the poet, the former lover of this uh, female author called Constance, they had a thing in the 60s when they were both quite a lot younger, quite a lot younger. Um, this, is, this is Gavin, the poet, watching um, Constance, the fantasy writer, being interviewed uh, via YouTube. Once upon a time, there wasn't any YouTube. <laughs> once upon a time, I could get away with reading the same thing over and over. But I can't do that anymore. So I've never read this um, out loud before. See, you, you already knew what I've been reading. So here we are. It's an interview, says Navina, from a few years ago. It's on YouTube. She clicks on the arrow and the video starts to play, this time with color and sound. It's at the World Fantasy Convention in Toronto. Gavin watches with mounting horror. A wispy old woman is being interviewed by a man dressed in a Star Trek outfit. <laughs> a purple complexion, a gigantic veined skull. A Klingon, Gavin supposes, though he doesn't know much about this cluster of memes. His poetry workshop students used to attempt to enlighten him when the subject came up in their poems. There's a woman on screen, too, with a glistening, plasticized face. That's the Borg Queen, Davina whispers. The wispy oldster is supposed to be Constance, says the YouTube title line, but he can't credit it. We're thrilled to have with us today someone who, you could say, is the grandmother of 20th century world-building fantasy, says the Borg Queen. C.W. Star herself, the creator of the world-famous Alphaland series. Should I call you Constance or Ms. Star? Or how about C.W.? <laughs> Whatever you like, says Constance, for it is indeed Constance, though much diminished. She's wearing a silver-threaded cardigan that hangs on her loosely. Her hair is like disordered, egret plumage, her neck's a popsicle stick. She peers around her as if dazzled by the noise and lights. I don't care about the name or any of that, she says. I only ever cared about what I was doing with Alpenland. Her skin 
sin is oddly luminous, like a phosphorescent mushroom. Didn't you feel brave writing what you did back when you started Test the Klingon? That whole genre was a man's world then, yes? Constance throws back her head and laughs. This laugh, this hairy, feathery laugh, was once charming, but now it strikes Gavin as grotesque, misplaced crispiness. Oh, nobody was paying any attention to me then, she says, so you couldn't really call it brave. Anyway, I used initials. Nobody knew at first that I wasn't <coughs> a man. Like the Bronte sisters, says the Klingon. Hardly that, says Constance with a sideways glance and a self-deprecating giggle. Is she flirting with the purple-skinned, veiny skull of God? <laughs> Gavin winces. Now she really does look tired, says Reynolds. I wonder who put that awful makeup on her. They shouldn't have used the mineral powder. How exactly old is she, anyway? So how do you go about creating an alternate world, says the Borg Queen? Do you make it up out of nothing? Oh, I never make anything up out of nothing, says Constance. Now she's being serious in that ditzy way she had. This is me being serious. <coughs> it had never convinced Gavin at the time. It was like a little girl wearing her mother's high heels. That seriousness, too, he had found charming. Now he finds it bogus. What right is she to be serious? You see, she continues, everything in Alphenland is based on something in real life. How could it be different? Does that go for the characters, too, says the Klingon? Well, yes, yeah, she says, but I sometimes take parts of them from here and there and put them together. Like Mr. Potato Head, says the board queen. Mr. Potato Head, says Constance. She looks bewildered. I don't have anyone of that name in Alphabet. <laughs> it's a toy for children, says the board queen. You stick different eyes and noses onto a potato. Oh, says Constance. That was after my time of being a child, she adds. The Klingon fills the pause. There's a big bunch of villains in Elfin Land. You get those from real life, too? He chuckles. Lots to choose from. Oh, yes, says Constance. Especially the villains. <laughs>